you know, I mean, it's 1972 since the last time I went to the moon. Um, so, yeah. Uh, oh, 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 one second. The green light is on. Yeah, we're live. We're live. Hello, WANS fans, and welcome to Mission Control. As always, here in Deepest Darkest Devon for the latest interstellar installment of We Are Not Scientists, where today we're once again discussing the super exciting NASA Artemis mission, which, as you've probably heard, is now in space. Hey, that's exciting stuff. <laughs> At last. Um, I'm here as always in Mission Control with our leader and most knowledgeable human here. Oh, I, I can say that for certain. Commander LP, how are you doing? I'm good, Simon. How are you? Yeah, I'm all, all, all good, thanks. And also, like, really, really good to have Christelle here. She's beaming in from a top secret bun bunker somewhere under the Canadian Arctic. We don't really know where that is yet. We'll find out one day. She's bringing the knowledge of uh, thousands of servers with her and, of course, her own knowledge as well. Hello there, Christelle. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. How are we doing? Oh, good. Oh, good. Good to, good to hear you. LP, Artemis has finally launched. Yes. Yes. Obviously, we like you mentioned, we had a bit of a wait. There were a few false starts. But uh, finally, on the 16th of November at uh, 0147 Eastern Seaboard time or 647 for us here in the morning in the UK, it, uh, it took off. Uh, from Kennedy Space Center's launch complex 39B, a very a very famous launch complex 39B. It's where a lot of the Apollo missions took off from. Uh, the space shuttle was launched from that launch pad many times. So uh, so yeah, a lot of history there, and great to see it finally finally take off after after all this uh, this wait. Uh, you were up very very late. Uh, I was in bed, so I didn't see it. But uh, you were up very late, weren't you, LP? <laughs> yes yes you're in your 24-hour nasa tv marathon <laughs> so so it all so it all went okay the launch then from someone who, who was yeah. watching it live yeah there was a, there was a slight delay um I, they, they did stop the countdown timer i think it was about 10 minutes to go for a little for a little while and there was a concern it wouldn't go the, the launch would be delayed again, uh, but some engineers went out onto the launch pad, and they're, they're brave because I mean that rocket was fully fueled, ready to go. So you know it really is a danger zone, and they got their spanners out, made a few adjustments, and and yeah, gave it the all clear to to, to launch. And at 0147 in on American time at night launch, uh, it it finally it finally took off. Christel, what what's the, what's the reaction been like on your on your servers? It's been been pretty hot, I guess. Oh, they've been going crazy. And I'll tell you what, I found that um, delay was really interesting. I was reading about that, chatting with the servers about it. Um, and I was trying to figure out what it was, what was the fault, because we've had so many false starts. And we've had so many issues in the past. Like, is it the same thing? What's going on? And it turns out it was uh, like a hydrogen valve. So while I didn't realize, but while the rocket is there waiting, it is burning its fuel, right? Like it's it's constantly burning and they need to keep it at like a kosher level at all times. So you've got the hydrogen and the liquid oxygen. Um, I think there's something like uh, three quarters of a million pounds of hydrogen and liquid oxygen in there. And they have to keep it at these levels. And they notice that they were going down, so they've found this small leak. They've called out Red Crew, and they've sent these three guys out onto the launch pad. They've torched some valves and and done some amazing work, and and yeah, they, they were able to launch it. Uh, that was like that's quite nail biting stuff because they got that is through there, yeah. Well, there's some serious jeopardy there, isn't there? I mean, like, uh, mm, and if they couldn't have fixed it, would it have launched? I don't know. So, so, so what's so what's going on? Right now, LP, where, where, where are we up to? I mean, did you want me to talk you, sort of give you a bit of detail on the actual launch and what went on, or are you please, just more please interested? Do, please do. Um, well, or basically, at the time of launch, the SLS um, fired its four uh, RS-25 rockets, rocket engines, and two solid booster rockets, which produced about 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust on takeoff. So this is like the biggest rocket nasa have ever made apparently the noise was just awesome the the nasa guys were like you know we've heard some loud rockets but this thing really did shake the earth the, um, that whole system fired for about two and a half minutes until the two solid rocket boosters they'd done their job uh really all they do is just lift the fuel all the fuel because it's the bigger your rocket the more you want to lift the more fuel you need but fuel weighs a lot so it's kind of like this diminishing return but so anyway after the two and a half minutes the uh the booster rockets uh, are jettisoned and then the the main core stage with its four 
engines, fired for about another eight minutes into the flight until that was kind of depleted. And that's when the big SLS section, the huge rocket thing you see stood on the launch pad, that's when that sort of done its job. So from then, the Orion module and the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, they, they then separate. The craft at that point is in low Earth orbit, spends a little bit of time in low Earth orbit for about 45 minutes. And then the cryogenic stage fires its little engine just, just to kind of get the get the, 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 the craft sort of pointing in the right direction, as it were. Then it carries out what's known as a translunar injection burn, uh, where it fires its rocket for about another 18 minutes. And that is when Orion was like, you know, actually off to the moon. So it sort of left Earth orbit and it is now en route. And here we are five days later. It's traveled about 380,000 kilometers, 240,000 wow. miles, if you're old school. Yeah, it's literally just a, a approach the moon today uh, and has swung in close, I think maybe 100 kilometers over the, sur uh, over the surface of the moon. And it will now carry close, on into close close, close. Yeah, I mean, 100 yeah 100 kilometers it's not it's not far you know you're going to take some nice pictures of the surface of the moon if you're if you're if you're that that close to it but now it will, will go out into sort of an eccentric orbit where it will kind of go out maybe sixty five thousand kilometers eccentric orbit yes yes so it kind of like it'll come <laughs> what's, in, it, what's it's an eccentric close. orbit this, except, yeah, because it's not like a it's not like a fixed altitude orbit. This will come in close and then we'll swing out and come in close and swing out. Um, and it's all to do with just essentially testing the performance of the craft, testing the systems. Because obviously, just to clarify for everybody, there's no there's no humans on board uh, today. It's it's purely they've got like a couple of mannequins and test dummies with sensors in, uh, but it's purely a, uh, a a test flight to to make sure. That if there are any problems, those problems are picked up with no humans on it and then rectified for subsequent missions that will be carrying humans. So that's kind of where we are today. Isn't it, LP, that the reason they're doing this um, eccentric orbit is to see how the craft actually functions in deep space? Because this is a completely different orbit than any of the other missions have taken, whereas like the Apollo missions were quite circular, you know, very close to the moon. This is going out into deep space and coming back in a, in a big sort of oval to test the equipment on how it's how it's going to function in that deep space atmosphere. Yeah, yes, I believe so, because this is the furthest a craft designed to carry humans has ever been into, as you say, almost like deep space. Uh, and again, I, I don't know whether that that oval shape centric orbit puts extra stresses on the craft and that's again they want to get some some better better idea because again if you're coming in and going out you know the ground the moon does emit gravity less than earth you know you're going to assume it's going to add some stresses and they want to understand how well the uh the craft can can sort of stand up to that i would assume i want to know more about these mannequins <laughs> christelle uh, any news from your service on, on who these mannequins are hold on hold on Right, so it looks like there are two mannequins on the on the craft. One's named Helga, and the other Zohar, which is pretty fun. Yeah, I like their names. And um, age, sex. Ah, uh, well, they're two female mannequins of the exact same measurement. So I'm not sure why they've decided to do that, but let's see. LP, do these mannequins have any scientific value? I'm not sure. I think they may they may have been given some sensors just again to let NASA know what kind of forces they are exposed to during launch, and, and also to, get, to gather data so NASA can better train uh, um, the the astronauts that will essentially take their place one day and really be aboard the Orion the Orion spacecraft. Because I, I think it the Orion is is designed to take four astronauts and apparently it's quite spacious i think it's over five meters in diameter which i think is twice the size that the, that the apollo guys had living um, in luxury those mannequins aren't they yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah you know apparently the seats are all adjustable it's, it's supposed to be quite a comfortable comfortable ride um yeah, I can see now. It's quite interesting. So they've been developed to measure the effects of radiation and exposure on the female body beyond the orbit of the International Space Station. Now, I wasn't sure if you were aware, but the um, the actual crew that are going to land, the, you're, they're going to have the first woman to walk on the moon and the first person of color to walk on the moon. So I suppose um, 
women have a higher risk than men of developing cancer. So they need to research how this radiation is going to affect them and their health long term, which is fa absolutely fascinating. Oh, and it uh, turns out they're called the Lunar Twins, which is pretty fun. It's a great band name, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that's 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 interesting, isn't it? Because again, for, for all of our listeners, you know, the guys that are up on the on the International Space Station, they are still in low Earth orbit, so they have quite a lot of protection from the Earth's magnetic fields and things. Uh, but once you get out, sort of, you know, well in out in, uh, away from the Earth, you have no protection of any description from highly charged solar radiation and particles flying through space it really is a very hostile environment and interesting they want to kind of get a better idea of how how those kind of particles would affect the the female physiology you know we've got um evidence of what happens to to, to men because men went on the apollo missions great that they're they're doing the research on on the women bo woman's body and it really is a project for humanity not just That's everybody isn't it i mean it's ridiculous oh, it's you know, just be, obviously like you know i've not been to the moon since 1972, so. <laughs> <laughs> Apollo 17. <laughs> Thank you, Commander. So there's not been any chance to take anyone to the moon, yeah. even to the moon since then, but... It was what... So it was we need pro progresses in, in, all, in, all, in all forms of forms of the word, yeah. No, definitely. And it's why NASA were, were very keen to launch at least the test flight before December, because I think it was December was the, the, the 50 years exactly since the last astronaut took off from the moon, so... So are we getting any image images? Are we getting any any pictures yet? Yes, there's been a few. Um, mm -hmm. If you for our listeners, if you check out sort of you know um, your media streams, I mean it's been on the BBC website. Um, you'll see it on various newspaper websites, and of course, just check out NASA.com. There's been loads on there. Go to the mission subcategory, click on Artemis, and you can see feeds of the moon actually very close up. Uh, some shots of different angles on the spacecraft. Uh, and everything else that's going on at the moment. There's a really cool video of the um, Orion flyby past the moon. So they've got a really cool video. You just sort of see the the tip of the module and then the moon just moving really, really slowly. It's quite hypnotic to watch, which is cool. But we can always put some links on the uh, Old Wan's Instagram page to um, share yeah. in our story so that people can just click those links and go and check out the videos. As far as how long the Artemis 1 mission has got left, I believe it's like 26 days around that altogether. So we're like, what, five days into it now? So it's got 21 days left. Yes. Yeah, no, no, another few weeks. Uh, again, just testing and making sure the craft does everything uh, they're expecting it to do before it heads back to Earth. Um, how long will it be going on its eccentric dance I think that'll be for about another two, two weeks, two and a half weeks. And it's then uh, probably another sort of four or five days back to Earth. The, it's the actual, the journey back is the really challenging thing. Um, and it's to do with the speed uh, that the Orion craft will come in fast. Um, and they, they've spent a lot of time sort of designing the heat shield to be able to sort of absorb the heat that will be generated when it hits the atmosphere. I, I think it's going to be coming in about 38,000 kilometers per hour. So wow. really hauling some backside. Um, it has the uh, service module that it will jettison before it reaches Earth. It will spin itself around to reveal the heat shield. Um, and then it will hit the atmosphere, breaking the sound barrier. And then, like I say, I think about 3,000 degrees Celsius, the heat shield is designed to, to withstand. And I've got to get the angle bang on. If you get the angle wrong, then the heat shield won't function and, and it'll burn up. So... Coming it's, right not, um, it's, it's not going to come down over deepest darkest Devon, right? <laughs> no, no, it's meant to land off the coast of California. Oh, okay, good. That's good yeah, to know. So, so yeah, and then then obviously it will slow as it comes into the atmosphere until it gets slow enough that the parachutes will be. Oh, formed. the parachute! I love the parachute. Good old parachute landing, and then and then it will splash down in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of California, as Christelle has just mentioned. And then out on a boat, get it back. Yep. I mean, that whole visual just gives me all the Moonraker vibes, you know? <laughs> Moon, Moonraker. <laughs> what a movie. Yeah, that is a, what are the, what are the, a classic sci-fi. A <laughs> masterpiece. <laughs> yeah. And then 
take you back to the to the labs. I'll analyze the kind of damage to the actual structure of it. You know Possibly. how many yeah. how many yeah. holes have been put in it through you know space particles and how much of a battering has it taken from solar radiation and solar winds and things like that. So I I, I suppose there's still a lot that they can learn from the actual machine itself um, once it lands safely. How long we've got to wait for the next uh, next launch and what will that involve? Yeah, I, th I think they're planning possibly 18 months to two years and then we get Artemis 2, which should be a, a crewed mission this time with humans on it. Not to land on the moon, but basically do the same thing. Take off, orbit the moon, test all the systems, make sure everything's okay, uh, fly back. And again, this will take humans further from Earth than humans have ever been by quite some distance. So that'll be an exciting one, I think. Yeah, on the moon, second time, what are they waiting for? <laughs> it's, a, it's a complex thing. You've got to remember the Apollo guys. They they sent um, remote missions and then manned missions that didn't land on the moon first. Apollo 8 was the first, I think, uh, manned crewed mission to go around to go around the moon. Um, and they they were the first humans to ever go behind the moon so they'd never the first humans essentially that had been out of sight of the earth which must have been quite an eerie eerie kind of feeling i suppose um so they'll they'll, they'll yeah the, the, the artemis 2 crew they will do the same and then hopefully by the end of the decade at the very latest we should be walking and living back on the moon it will be artemis 3 which go up in the late 2020s uh to to, to land and set the first kind of uh, moon base up really um third mission well, then yeah, the third, third mission will be that will be the, the one where we see where we see humans back back actually walking and living and working on the moon. Oh. And again, I'm not sure on the third mission how long they'll stay, but there is this idea that they want a permanent base. And there's other things I think we mentioned in our last Artemis uh, podcast about they want to have like a, an orbiting space station around the the moon. So it's kind of like the, the Orion capsules will all sort of essentially. Uh, connect onto that and then there'll be kind of craft that'll go up and down to the lunar surface uh, and they'll just they'll expand the, the complexity of the mission until they're ready maybe by the 2030s to launch a mission out to mars uh, you know that's the old that's the ultimate end game uh to have a gateway to to, to head out uh into even deeper space so so, so there's a long, long way to go yet yeah, but uh, uh great that the first five days have been uh successful yeah as far as we're aware everything's going according to plan because of course a setback a serious setback at this point could put a project like this back by years so the fact everything is is, is going well is, is is a really good sign because if it doesn't then maybe maybe we don't get back to the moon this decade and we, we kind of really want to um we, we said before you've got to remember as well i mean nasa's budget now compared to what it had in the apollo missions president kennedy just went there's a blank checkbook write what you've got to write and, and we'll give you the money whereas now nasa's budget is just a fraction of what the apollo missions had um, and this, that's NASA's whole budget for, for James Webb, for all of its other activities. So we want to get it right because, um, yeah, you, you don't get many chances at this. OK, so uh, Artemis flying, doing well so far, which is great, great news. And the James Webb telescope is still breaking boundaries, new boundaries in, in space. Oh, it, it's the uh, it's the space gift that keeps on giving, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I saw recently um, it, it's imaged two galaxies, and I think one of them is believed to date back 350 million years after the Big Bang. I mean, well, you know, if you consider the universe today is 13.8 billion years, we are talking when the universe was very, very young. Uh, they're even suggesting that these galaxies may have started to form only 100 million years after the Big Bang. I think what's fascinating, Simon, is the more we use James Webb to look deeper and deeper into space and therefore closer and closer to the to the Big Bang, the earlier we th see things forming, even earlier than I think we had anticipated, so, so star formation, galaxy formation, yeah, as soon as there was enough matter and, you know, uh, uh, was set free, you know, to form stars and galaxies, these, these things formed very, very early on. So, yeah, really, really interesting. What was that? What was that noise? Uh, oh, was that you? Oh, well, it's not me personally, but it 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 is coming from over here. Um, that's Bob. New, new, new server, because <laughs> he doesn't sound like your servers. 
uh well um no it's not a server it's it's a you know i like to make stuff you know i like to invent yeah, things the it's, it's little something i've been working on it gets lonely up here it's a uh, it's you know just me and my servers so i decided that i would uh make a little assistant bot and Ooh. um yeah i mean it's gone well so far but i've just discovered that it's it's got a particular a particular thing that it likes to do and it doesn't really want to do anything else what's that it just likes to read children's books okay <laughs> <laughs> so what one of your so one of your servers is is a uh, is, is is into reading children's books. Uh, yeah, I mean it's a bit of a weird quirk. I I don't know what it was. I don't know what it is in the in the in the makeup of this little thing. But it's decided that children's books are its thing. So although it was meant to be um a bit of an assistant to help me with the servers, help keep them under control, I've decided since it's happy reading books, I'm going to make it the librarian. It's called my book bot. 0.1 or bob is you know because bob. bob's a little bit more fun than bb 0.1 isn't it are, are you okay Chriselle? yeah i'm okay could have got any evidence of this um well yeah i mean it has started doing reviews of the books that it's been reading okay um, i could yeah, you could hear one. I could send it over. Okay, well, let's give it a listen. Okay, here we have Bob, the WANS librarian. Hello, everybody. I'm Bob, the WANS librarian, and I love to investigate what's in space. Today I'm going to be reviewing a book called Big Questions About the Universe. The book is made by Alex Frith and Alex X. James, and this is one of the many books from the WANS library. Okay, so let's start reading the book. So, it seems like there's a little robot and he's going to be answering us lots of questions. Here is, is some of the questions that they're going to answer. How high do astronauts fly? How much does it cost to go to space? How many galaxies are there? Why is space stuff around? What's a black hole? Do stars ever stop shining? How many moons are there? What's the weirdest object in space? Will people ever live on Mars? How does the sun work? How do you become an astronaut? Does the universe have an edge? And my favourite fact that I learnt in the book, that Saturn has at least 83 moons? But only 53, he have official names, and here are just five of the names of the moons. Titan, Rhea, Lapetus, Dione, and Tethys. I don't know how to pronounce that. I would recommend this book to little kids who want to learn about space, people who want to be scientists, and even people who just want to learn about space. It's amazing, and I will give this 4.5 megabytes out of 5 megabytes. So, join me next time when I read the book See Inside Science by Alex Frith and Colin King. Wow, um, I think you might be onto something there, Christelle. Uh, Bob Bob seems to be a uh, neurologically sound for for a server. For such a young server as well, you know, it just keeps taking in that information and pumping out reviews. So we've got to do something with them, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and Bob says that, that, that there's another book coming up next. We're gonna gonna have more of these reviews uh, from Bob. Yeah, I don't know how to make Bob stop, so I think there's definitely going to be more reviews. It just just keeps on going. <laughs> it is also the gift that keeps on giving. LP, what do you think about Bob? Very, very interesting. Very interesting. I'm loving the Bob's interest in in space as well. You know, the first book to be reviewed. It's, it's right on point, isn't it? Is it space space books that Bob's interested in? Science books? Is, is that the kind of niche that that, that she's she, she's going down? Yeah, there must be something in the programming that she's picked up. I mean, maybe listening to us record when she was in her early stages of development. But 
it is a space and science kind of enthusiasm that I've got going on here, which is pretty nice. Yeah, I, I think I think we should definitely return to, to, to Bob next episode. Definitely. Um, talking about the next episode, uh, we are going to do a review of the year next month, December. So get your thinking cap on, Commander LP. What's, what's been the highlights of this this year for you? <laughs> I will do, Simon, will do. Space and Science Roundup. I like it. Yeah, that's it. That's about it for today. Uh, I think it'd be nice, actually, today in this episode to, to finish uh, with a little message from you and your mantra, Commander LP, because it's, it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> OK, thank you, Simon. Well, I always say, never stop looking up, never stop wondering. Beautiful. And on that note, that beautiful, thoughtful note, it's goodbye from the ones crew. Goodbye. 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 Bye. Bye.